All right, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight to Precog Time with Nancy Goldring, who is an amazing artist and friend. And we're so lucky and thrilled to get to talk with you about um, your work and all of the many, many projects, collaborations, and enterprises that you've been a part of. Um, so we just want to start the start this the way that we've been starting all of this, which is how um, to ask you how you've been doing during the pandemic um, and what it's been like for you in and out of the studio. Okay. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed coming to your precog things. It's sort of opened a new world to me, you know, um, one tends to just hang out with one's friends that they've known for a long time. So this was a, a really interesting uh, path to take, um, sort of add to the surreal moment of the, the <laughs> pandemic. Um, I think I, my answer about how it's been during uh, the pandemic really has to do with what day you get me. You know, because I think there was this whole long period of just absolute insane uh, hysteria about what was going on in the world. And, uh, you know, listening to MSNBC and Trump, et cetera. And then this sort of vague dread of the virus, you know, should I really wash my orange off when I bring it home? You know, th that kind of thing. But essentially, my life wasn't that different in terms of work. I just would get up and draw until a certain hour. I'd do an hour of French. Then I'd go walk five miles <laughs> or go swimming and then try to find a movie mm. and try to find something to eat. But that was that, you know, you just sort of get into a rhythm, which is good for work in a way. So. <laughs> So has it been, so you've been making um, a lot of work throughout the, throughout this weird year. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of work until about, I think six weeks ago when I just decided I was exhausted. <laughs> it mm -hmm. was time to just stop and be mm -hmm. quiet for a while. That's but, really important, the pauses. Um, and it's interesting because I think there's also a lot of space. There's spaces like pauses in your work as well. Like your work has a whole grammar that includes a kind of busyness and also a quiet as well, areas of density and areas of um, space. Um, but with that, I think we should just jump into to your work. Um, and so you've developed a way of making images and imagery, which you call photo projections. Um, <laughs> generally, yeah. Generally. <laughs> um, and I'll pull one up that Nancy's including in the forthcoming issue of Precog Magazine, which is really amazing. Um, and uh, I just was wondering if you could talk us through both um, what these are and how you've developed them and also how you arrived at this way of making imagery as well. Uh, well, maybe we should go up where there are those windows at the beginning. Okay, we'll start there. Okay, revamp. Yeah. <laughs> It'll in a way explain how I got to do, doing these photo projections. <laughs> so is it, uh oh, there you go. Yes. So this was um, very early. I had just come to New York and was making these drawings uh, with pen, croquil pen or pencil or graphite and of the view outside my window. And um, it occurred to me that it would be interesting to take a black and white photograph and put it together with that uh, drawing. This was on the left is just a drawing, um, but I made it sort of like an intaglio. I built it up so it was, there was a, a kind of relief to it. And um, this man was writing a book called Experimental Drawing and asked if I would uh, contribute one this image on the right. 
And so I, I, first of all, I didn't know how to print black and white. I just made someone show me how to do it. And then I didn't know how to photograph and make a slide of that black and white image. So um, I started experimenting. And if you go to the next, um, I was projecting that sandwiched image to see if it was okay to send in and it landed on the Venetian blinds. Mm. And I thought, this is, I was probably smoking a lot then. And I thought, this is really cool. <laughs> and <laughs> tried to figure out how to photograph it. So my first show was just all these variations on playing with projecting back onto the window, which was the original thing I was drawing. So it was kind of just a surprise, really. But once you start, it's hard to stop. Is there one more after that of the window? Yeah. And then I realized, you know, you can project onto people, furniture, all kinds of things. So it was just a period of total experimentation mm. at that early time. Um, and it's really hard to photograph projections. And it's very complicated with color. And I'm not someone who can calculate all that. So I could do it once, but maybe couldn't repeat it again. <laughs> you know, so the element of surprise is kind of intriguing when you're working. So I think essentially from that time, it's been one big experiment, sort of, oh, well, what if I do this? And what if I do that? So it's kind of endless. Um, and every time I do something different, I think, I can't believe for 20 years that didn't occur to me. <laughs> you know, that kind of feeling. Mm. So now you can go down to the one from Precog. Oh, I was going to say also that like the difference. Um, so you wanted to start here. Um, back, back before that. Maybe here? Yes. OK. Um, but that. Uh, so this the the kind of interaction between mediums is clearly really important to you. Um, but since I've known you at least, um, and Flo definitely as well, drawing has also, I mean, I guess it's also continued from the beginning that drawing has been such a major influence on the work and maybe an origin and a parallel process for you in terms of how you um, both draw from observation and isolate particular elements of drawings. And I was wondering, maybe this is a, a time to kind of talk about that a little bit as well. Um, what role drawing plays and how it functions for you in the work? Well, I think drawing is just the basis of everything. I, I mean, I don't ever just invent something cold. Everything comes from looking whether I'm looking at a dream image in my mind or mm -hmm. looking out on a landscape or cityscape or a plant. It's, and uh, it's a matter of trying to draw exactly what I see, which it, it doesn't make in, any sense really effectively. I mean, you can draw sort of extrapolating, et cetera, but no, I want to draw it exactly as I see it. So for example, this little drawing on the left uh, was part of a series of probably 70 drawings that I have of this view from my studio in Sartiano. And uh, I had been drawing that view forever and ever. And I, I got tired of being so distant from what I was drawing. So I started drawing the shadows cast by this lemon tree plant in my studio as it hit the wall and the floor and my desk. So I just connected them. And then I decided to carry on with these shadows. So for one whole summer, I just drew these shadows as they moved across the wall. And um, then, you could go to the next. Over, right? Yes. Yeah, OK. So that the, this is an example of drawing these shadows. And it meant I had to get up at the, 
about the same time every morning to catch the shadows in the right place because they change so much. So I realized that I could um, sort of generate a whole room just by these shadows on mm. the planes that they were falling on. Um, so that was a, a long period of drawing uh, that stage. And then I think the next two slides or Yeah. Yeah. So then the following summer, I, I really didn't want to keep doing that because that was done. And I decided to imagine that if the shadows themselves cast shadows, where would that space be? And what would it look like? And um, it bothered me that I couldn't calculate where the light would come from onto the shadows to make whatever world it was behind. And so what I did was decided, well, I can make it wherever it's where I want it to be. So these, I did a whole series where the shadows were painted with the colors of the landscape and then invented their shadows as, as they might be. And so these are examples of that. This was a whole summer of doing this. And then in the next, so it all came, I mean, this is all over a two year period, mm -hmm. this process and many. And so the drawing on the left um, is kind of the finished piece. Uh, and I called it shadow of a doubt. <laughs> The others were shadows, shadows. It's hard to see, it was so hard to photograph this, but the bottom part is my desk and then the floor and the walls. And you can see the, the pot that had the lemon tree plant in it. And I discovered that I could work with whites and each area had a different white. So it really takes you know, careful looking to see it. And I did about 14 of these till I, got it right and it's pretty big it's you know maybe 36 inches high and then i made a relief model of that drawing on um, plexiglass with mylar and where there is mylar where it's sort of gray would be a projection screen from the rear and then pieces of slides would be projected onto these certain areas in from the front. And I used for the shadows in every different plane, uh, silver or gold. It was actually gold leaf. All of this took a while to learn how to do. You can get amazing skills if you want <laughs> to. <laughs> so then I worked going, and came up with about 10 different solutions by projecting actual shadows, by, by projecting the plant. So in some of them, where there's say a real plant behind it, it's as if we are on the other side of the shadows looking to what was cast in the shadows. And so um, in the one on the right, for example, I used a landscape that I had used in another piece. And all of it, um, it I, it's a regulation I have. All of it has to be material from that spot. I couldn't, mm -hmm. except I did cheat with the, the plant, the second from the left. Um, I bought a, a lemon tree plant on Amazon. <laughs> And it arrived and it was a wonderful plant. It was just flourishing. And so I cast its shadows because I needed to get a different effect. So this goes on for a while, this process of projecting because that's this is really the fun experimental part, you know, to see what works and you get ideas and get new ideas that eventually you just sort of can't do anymore and it's time to move on. So this is about a sequence over two years to get to this. Nancy, it's, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, what were you gonna ask? 
Oh, I was going to say it strikes me, um, especially the first the first way that you were talking about drawing, right? The idea that you want to draw what you see, whether that's the observation literally outside your window or like an observation of the image as an object in the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that there's a way where um, like the repetition in your work is a way of continuing to observe that object that like the drawing functions like a kind of fixative in a way that allows it to have a um, concrete or coherent shape as a, as a kind of um, like as a kind of object like as a kind of visual memory and that the redeployment of, you know, for instance, like this shape of the shadow, which recurs all the time, or, you know, the transition from the shadows, um, some of the forms in the shadows in the drawing on the left to the way that they're kind of redeployed on the right. Like I almost can see them becoming um, memory objects, or I can almost see them um, turning into something which is observable from the mind, which is really interesting. Um, and a pretty novel way, I think, of um, considering what abstraction can do or what the function of abstraction is as a process of furthering from, like, creating greater and greater distance from, um, you know, an, ob an observed object or something like this. But anyway, I was just sort of thinking it, about that. It's connection. sort of, I think it was interesting that you used the word fix because that's what it's like. You know, it's as if I'm getting it a, a memory form in 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 my mind. The one where there are three pictures and there's an Italian landscape with buildings. Do you see that one? Yep, no. I'm getting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, this is the first one I did in um, in this town in Italy. And I had this really minuscule balcony. I, I had squeezed myself into it. And these were the views from my balcony in different directions. And I drew probably seven hours a day trying to get this medieval uh, village architecture right. And I, I mean, I have just mounds of drawings. And then at a certain point, it was in my head and I could draw it without looking. So I think your notion of fixing it is a good one. Uh, I know this is jumping ahead a little bit uh, in the, or I mean, I guess we, we give you some questions to think about beforehand, but I, it feels like that's sort of like an interesting transition. Um, something that Flo and I were talking about is really interesting is your um, your relationship with Robert Lax, who is a, a concrete poet um, in Greece, uh, you met and maintained a friendship for decades, no? Um, and it sort of strikes me that this way of thinking through images, the isolation of form, the kind of deployment and redeployment of form as material and as a sign has a, um, has a has a close relationship to concrete poetry and the ways that words are treated as material and as image in a way. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe also talk about um, your relationship to poetry and Bob. <laughs> well, the Bob, for those of you who don't know, uh, he, he died, I guess, about 12 years ago, uh, was a very good friend of Ad Reinhardt's and, um, Thomas Merton, and at a certain point, he was, I think, writing movie reviews for uh, Time Magazine or The New Yorker or something, and he said he couldn't pick up his head anymore off the desk, and the next thing he knew, he was traveling with a circus <laughs> in France, so, and he ended up then living on the island of Patmos in a, a small house and not as isolated as, as it would seem. And I, I met him, I had gone off to Greece on my own. And when I got to Patmos, uh, everybody kept saying, did you meet Petrus? Did you meet, uh, they called him the rock. Um, 
And so we met and everybody decided I was his daughter because we sort of looked alike. It was very interesting. And we would meet every day at the end of the day and he would read what he had been doing. And um, he was a wildly funny, funny, funny man. And uh, we, we have a long correspondence of his things. And he would look at what I was doing. That summer, I, decide, I, I read a lot of novels, a real escape. But that summer, all I did was uh, bring The Palm at the End of the Mind by um, Wallace Stevens. So that's all I was reading. And so a lot of the poems, those images came out of the poems. Even if I was looking out you know, at the boat in the harbor or up at the monastery. Mm. And, um, I think that probably the most interesting uh, day with him, he showed up outside on the balcony outside my room. And I said, I just have to finish this one thing. I'll be right out. And somehow it went on for about an hour and I didn't realize he'd be sitting there waiting, but he just sat in pure silence waiting for me to finish. It's really, he's a hard, you, you all, if you haven't read him, you should. They're, they're just reissuing a lot of his poems. They're frequently just single words. We collaborated on a big installation piece. I don't know if I put it in there, I can't remember. Um, it would be a big screen with, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to do a piece that would be sort of like, let me see if I put it in. You go down farther. Maybe I didn't. Yes, the, uh, yes, the one up above, yeah. I want to do a, an equivalent of, um, Pier de Francesca's Legend of the Two Cross, a kind of legend. And um, so I went twice to meet him and with some of the images that I was working on. And then that we, we would look at an image and then he would write a line. And it was very fair. It started out, there are no facts, only events. And then the next one would be the beginning, the beginning, the end, the end. <laughs> and in retrospect, I wish these had not been such complicated images. But um, anyway, it was that was an exciting collaboration. Nancy, since we're talking about collaboration, I also wanted to ask you about um, collaborating and being a founder of the Experimental Art Group site. And if you could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Um, someone told me last year that this image was up in the big windows of uh, some, um, you know, storefront show. I have no idea how it got there. Life-size figures. It was, um, I met, um, the big fellow behind there, James Wines, who had been really a sculptor, and um, Cynthia Erdley, the third, the woman in the middle. And uh, we got to talking about um, public art, I guess we would call it that. I had just arrived back in New York from Italy, where I had had a studio in a huge uh, building with eight architects. And they were always there making drawings. And it was a very lively, exciting time. You know, this is 1968, 69. And um, th there were all kinds of um, in inventive uh, ways to entertain each other. And one day we put inflatable balloons in the air outside the studio and projected slides onto them, for example. And it was uh, an acti group activity, which was fun. And um, so gradually we kept meeting and then we decided to form a group. 
and we were going to t talk about um, public sculpture and ways of initiating work that was purely a collaboration with artist and architect in designing places and spaces. And so our work was essentially coming up with proposals. So there would be drawings and models and conversation. And the idea was that we didn't sign our work. Everything was signed sight. And uh, that's where the, the term site specific was born. So we're talking 1972. That, and we put out a magazine, et cetera, and did a lot of lecturing. And um, this was an example of what I would contribute. It was a little um, article. <laughs> we had our first commission was a shopping center. I don't think I put in the solution, but it, you can find it online. Um, so I was proposing what we didn't want to do. We didn't want plop art. We also invented that term. Um, and we, we didn't want it to be uh, decoration, et cetera. So if that's the kind of uh, visual work I was doing besides uh, drawings, which were proposals. And the first shopping center was designed by Cynthia Erdley. Her name, however, was removed. When we quit, what happened was uh, the remaining people just started putting their names on all the projects, which was uh, a pretty terrible thing to do. But uh, Cynthia's piece had a brick facade that looked as if it had come unstuck. And it was, you know, as if you had glued a, a piece of paper down and the edge popped up and there was a bright color I think it was red beneath it. And uh, apparently it was kind of startling if you were driving down the highway. So that was, that was that activity. And eventually as groups do, uh, we went different ways. They wanted wow. to become really a design center and a business. And I- really, right. How long did you work together? About three years, mm. three years and then Wow. Yeah. And then after everyone took the projects and just made it uh, like their own and not a collaborative thing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But a book came out uh, about sight with its history mm. and resurrected a lot of the early projects. So. Mm. Um, and architecture, um, it's sort of it's interesting because even like the way you talk about the shopping center um, is as a kind of stage almost, especially the relationship between the art and the the complex. Um, and of course, your work has a lot to do with the kind of staging um, and often incorporates architectural elements. So I just sort of wanted to open that conversation up as well. Right. Your work is treats art as something which kind of happens on top of a surface as though it was decorating a wall, even though it's not decorative and very much complicates the surface. Well, if you put up the one with the tunnel, it's easy to talk from that. Is that right. is, um, I think I put it in there. Is this the tunnel? Oh, no, that's a different one. But we can talk about this. <laughs> this was a, um, a show that I had very early on at the museum in um, Jackson, Mississippi. And I mean, it's, we call it now an installation, but it was just an idea I had that I wanted to do. I had spent this some summer on the island of Stromboli. And um, I had a space where I was working and drawing the same images every day. And um, so I decided I wanted to recreate that and then project these invented uh, spaces that I had contrived by projecting onto a model of the buildings. I mean, it sounds crazy now that I look back at it, but they were very um, helpful. And I was working with uh, these guys who had never built theater perspective. And that was a, a challenge. But you, 
you walked in through the door and there was another house in which the projectors were right in front of this. So the, the projection came through there. And I also included sound. I went to a radio station and got the sound of ocean hitting rocks that would be there to, to muffle the projector. So the idea really is to create a space that isn't real, but that feels like it's real. So that's the kind of architecture. Mm. And this one came from a dream image, literally. I, I had a lot of my work where I would have this image from a dream that I remembered it so clearly that I could create it, mm. you know? So in this one, I was looking out the window at a view and this building, I think, reminded me somehow of Port Authority, vaguely. And the, while this was happening, I was also teaching my Friday afternoon drawing class. And that's in the foreground. And all the people in the center, I made, this was before Photoshop existed. So I went to Grand Central Station and photographed people in line over and over again. So it was the same group of people, but in different position. And then I just montaged them together. And mm -hmm. this was called The Traveler Remembers. Um, and interestingly, it was in a show on um, sequential. And there's sort of like different ways of imagining the specifics of the dream mm -hmm. in that place. Um, the curator who came to pick it up, Julia Ballerini, when she looked at it, she said, where is that? I know I've been there, <laughs> which was great. <laughs> um, Nancy, can you talk about uh, traveling? Because a lot of your photographs are, you know, you shoot in Italy and in Cuba, India. How does being at a different place um, affect what you do? Well, this is sounds strange, but when you're looking, sort of every place is a different place. Mm -hmm. That's true. It, it, but I, I, did, I did travel just all the time. And um, it was a way of understanding where I was. You know, I mean, if, if you're wandering around, I did um, a lot of work in, in Burma, Myanmar, and um, to understand where you were. You never can as an outsider, but it's sort of a document of the attempt. Oh, this one. Uh, this one actually ended up being a, a, a big installation. And I had planned on going to, to Egypt. And then my father got very sick and was in the hospital. So I spent the time when I would have been in, e in Egypt uh, in his room. So I eventually did go, but um, I had been reading uh, Flaubert's travels in, in Egypt as he imagined them when, before he went. So it seemed an appropriate book. And so what I did was take the text from that book combine the images that I had taken there, actually some images by Ducamp, who traveled there with Flaubert. And so it, it covers not going and going and being in this place imagining. And I made the entire composition based on the dimensions of the large pyramid. So that was sort of grounded it. And then it was a chance ripping. I just ripped the paper out of this. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was about 15 feet across. And um, it was a live projection. There were about 35 different images that would fade one into the other very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 
in the end, you have get a sense of what it felt like for me to be there. I think my my exploration. I'm just going to keep moving through the images as we talk so that we get a chance to um, just even get an impression or a sense of um, the kind of work. Um, when I suggested talking um, about curtains, you suggested redirecting that in terms of dreams. Mm -hmm. um, and you've talked a little bit at this point about drawing from your dreams directly. Um, but I also, you know, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, maybe like even abstractly about dreams and windows, you know, like the, the window, the aperture seems like it's kind of the um, sort of symbolic foundation of a lot of your work. Um, it's like the place as well as, you know, this relationship to projection and whether and how images um, become legible and shift. Um, and so, yeah, like, how do you, how do you think about dreams and, uh, what's your relationship to windows and images? Well, I think there's sort of two different facets, but the windows really did start this project of 50 years of working because it's a framing device. And what it does is it establishes where you are and your relationship to the rest of the world. And it is then this threshold or this membrane through which you approach your place in the world. And it establishes the scale um, and what you can see through it. Um, and so it seemed not calculated, but when I would sit down, that would be where I'd begin, you know, unless I was outside, that's where I would begin, mm -hmm. um, that construct. And I, there's a, uh, an architect named, so a lot of them, by the way, are just the same view out my window, um, um, Aldo uh, Rossi did a beautiful drawing, I should have included it, where his shadow falls across a drawing, a, a deep, sort of rough sketch of a city. Mm. And it's sort of just saying, I'm here, I'm looking at it, and this is sort of my connection with that world out there. Um, this was a very specific project, a rather elaborate one that I did for the city of Parma. Um, they commissioned me to do a, a show of, about the monuments of the, the city. And um, then to, to do one of the things I do, one of these photo projections, I will never think of them as anything as <laughs> quick projections. <laughs> um, and so for that, I used um, the idea of the studiolo or the little room that the prince used to retire to, to contemplate life, et cetera. And it was a form that grew up in the 15th century and at the same time that perspective did. And um, each panel in the room would be a, a, a perspectival view, usually one point perspective and done with inlaid wood pieces in tarsier. And so I was able to go into the sacristy of their uh, cathedral and photograph these panels and then use that as a way to sort of uh, gather and distill all of this material that I had photographed by combining it. And one of the panels in the center image here, one of the panels was missing the inlaid wood. So it was like, I, I could therefore use it as a kind of archeology span of that place. 
carving into it. So none of this is real. So it functions on a kind of level, a collage level, really. Yeah. You can't really put it back together as something. Oh, yeah. And then they asked me to build the studio. So I went back a couple of years later and I had the set builders for their opera. And they were really good. However, they were hard to keep at work. You had to have a coffee in the morning, then you had an appetizer before lunch, and then a coffee in the afternoon, and then appetizer time. So once I got their rhythm going, it was okay. And so these are all those panels. It was a little room, I guess it's just about 15 feet. And it was in a little palace, a palace that um, Napoleon had built for his wife. And so it was, there are all these trompe l'oeil paintings in the ceiling. They were really quite glorious. And these panels were rear projections. And not every one of them changed, every other one changed. So it seemed like they were all changing, but very slowly. So it was a kind of slow change, slow alternation. Mm. So it's there somewhere. <laughs> um, I want to circle back to dreams. Okay, the one you used for the announcement was a dream. That's a fine that floating figure, I think it's up at the beginning. Yeah. Is it this one? Yes. I think this was right after I came back from uh, Thailand where there were all these houses on poles, et cetera. So I had this very, really powerful image of this hovering luminescent figure. Um, and th this is what it looked like. And so I did it with very, oh, actually then, in fact, I had gone to Costa Rica for a couple months. And so a lot of the slides are from Costa Rica in this series. And so just by changing the material, it could change sort of the feel of the place. It was like saying, well, uh, was it Pacific? Was it menacing, et cetera? And um, the, the landscape itself gets very kind of abstracted, I think, the kind of level of abstraction that I'm interested in is in Mondrian's ocean and pier drawings, where it's just at that edge of being able to make it something real, and then it goes away. You can't hold on to it. That, that relationship between sort of what's real and what's not. Um, in these, it sort of, it highlights this um, aspect of your work where um, it almost looks like we have to look through the dream in order to get at the image in such a way that you're never really looking at either. Um, and that also is something, it's a kind of effect or affect that um, recurs in your work. Um, the idea that there are always that the image appears kind of in relationship to obstacles to it, um, which themselves comprise the image. Yes, I think that's what your curtain question refers to, really. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of um, layering, though I'm never layering slides. You know, there's only one at a time, but the sort of abstracted landscape allows it to um, sort of dissolve what I've projected. Right. Um, and it also then confuses, like for instance, in this, um, in this pair, right? The, the edge that you've cut out ends up confusing and complicating um, the projection in a way where you, the, there's a kind of material um, confusion or condensation or something like this that occurs where well, you- Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, projection is sort of focal and there's a fixed point and you don't move. 
but I'm using projection where you, there's probably no place where you're standing. There's no place where you could stand. So it's like denying what projection is at the same time I'm using it. Um, Nancy, you also, this is sort of like really to the side, but um, you also have written a lot about artwork. You're, an ex you're kind of a prolific writer um, over the course of, uh, you know, your, your art career. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, and you also are very uh, studious. You like spend a lot of time reading and researching. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of writing in your work and maybe life. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I'm a kind of fallen away art historian. I was all primed to go to the Institute, etc. And then I decided, no, I'd rather go to Italy. <laughs> sort of, I gave up that whole part of my life. But um, I think where they coincide is my um, going all the way back to college, my thesis was on the Theodosian obelisk base in Constantinople in 303 AD. And I was, I had a whole year on that. And what I discovered in that was traces of illusionistic perspective and how it merged into um, non-perspectival space, flat space. So that discovery got me thinking about how perspective works, et cetera. And um, I think liking to look and working from images, sometimes it helps to put them into words. And um, I especially like writing illustrated books, you know, where my point is made visually and verbally. I enjoy doing that. And um, I also like writing about people whose work I like. Um, and I mostly hung out with architects who didn't build, but who drew. Mm. So it was, fun to write about their work too. Um, and it's, it, it becomes then a, co a conversation with the work. Yeah, I was surprised I had, I was applying for a grant, you had to list your publications and I was shocked to see that they were there because I never consider it as, you know, a serious occupation, but keep doing it. Nancy, what are you reading right now? Oh, <laughs> it's not fun. I have to do an interview with my friend Mick Tausig about Bataille in his work, in his writing, about which Bataille was not someone I really knew a lot about. So I spent the last five days reading everything I could about Bataille. So you're researching right now. I'm researching, yeah. I, I just finished a novel by John Banville, which was fun. Mm. When yeah. does, what's the interview going to be published? It's going to be in a magazine called November. Okay, so oh. it's like October. No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a new magazine though, right? I think I it is it online yeah. and it's pretty. Lauren O'Neill yeah. Butler is the one who instigated this but uh, it's funny yeah <laughs> so is it it's a new magazine and it just came out oh. i think there are about six issues okay they don't have a schedule yeah it's hard yeah. to have a schedule now. <laughs> <laughs> um, um do we have any questions yeah if anybody has any questions that they want to include just drop them in the chat if not i'm gonna nancy i was gonna ask you um if like, um, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I'm wondering if psychoanalysis has anything to do with the structure of your work. You know, it's like, there's so many elements of, you know, just 
projection, like there's, I mean, all of the tropes, right? It's like projection is part of it and condensation and dream language. And like, yeah, I wonder how you're thinking about um, maybe not, obvious, obviously not the therapeutic elements of it, but like the visual structures that are kind of implicit in psychoanalytic thought. Ah, uh, it may be there by osmosis, but not, yeah. <laughs> not on purpose, I would say. Not consciously, how's that? Good enough, <laughs> good enough. I, uh, would, I would have my students recreate dreams. They could do it in movies and drawings or paintings or something, but they had to promise not to tell me the dream. always tedious um and you were a teacher for a long, long time 46 and a half years <laughs> i know a lot <laughs> a lot it's really a lot it wasn't hard to leave <laughs> <laughs> i was really ready <laughs> Um, and then what are you, so now you're taking a break. You had like a moment of you were working a lot during the pandemic and now you're just taking a minute. Um, what were you working on in the pandemic? Like a series? Yeah, uh, if you go down to the end. If, okay. If, you, if it's not too many pictures. Nope, let me just get it together. Um, if you wanna start talking about it, I'll just uh, pull it up. The, actually, the day before the shutdown, I had gone down to um, uh, the area down um, by the bridge downtown and um, photographed these really strange reflections on empty storefronts. And so um, I started doing these drawings of the ref that I had photographed. So I was sort of working from photographs and they, these were, I called them dislocations because that's sort of how I was feeling at the time. You know, everything was not clear. And um, so this was a whole series, uh, this, these first ones. And then, um, I found these great reflections on car windows. People couldn't believe I was drawing cars. <laughs> it was not in my purview. And so I did those for a while. Um, and then I went down, I was walking five miles up and down, up and down the river. <laughs> and there, I saw this really bizarre boat and um, started drawing it and then I got to know the guys working on the boat and learned that they were fixing the the support system under the piers and they it was a diving boat and they would go down under the into the dark water and uh, repair these um, columns or piers and so I ended up spending a lot of time drawing this boat and getting to know how they did what they are doing. And then they explained that this had been an oil barge before and refitted for what they're doing. And so all those funny things up on the top of the boat, which felt like a still life, um, served no purpose at all. They were just left over from the previous life of that boat. So um, then I was asked to write an article for a magazine in Italy about what was, it was like in New York. So I ended up describing what it was like. And then you can go up to the cover of the book. This uh, publisher in Germany asked if he could publish it in Germany. So it's now a little book. And so that, that came out, I guess, um, in December. So that was a, a project. But it was really interesting. I would go every day to the boat. And if if my bench was gone, I would make the guys move it back. So, so I could sit and draw in the same position. 
but uh, and took a lot of photographs. Everyone I know made sort of archives during the pandemic, mm. you know, taking photographs is a kind of document. So we have a few questions in the chat now before we formally wrap up. Um, first, Michael Lee wants to know if you can talk a little more about the rules you impose on yourself in the photo projections. Yeah, it's it's strange. The first one is that I can't use uh, any material that's not of the subject I'm working on. So if I'm in, in Italy and I have a whole bunch of slides, those are the ones I have to use. So it's real in the same way that the drawing is accurate and real. So that's the, the primary one. And then there's sort of no more rules. Some of them are upside down and some are backwards. And sometimes a rock becomes a mountain. So um, just that one re rule really. Um, and Adam Putnam would like to know, um, or says, uh, there's an overt use of projection in your work of space of and of light. Um, but what about the projection of time um, or time as another dimension? Is that something you're thinking about? Time, but without a, a specific order. Mm -hmm. So that all of these can, um, can appear in almost any order. And uh, to, to solve that, I used to put sort of eight pictures under one long mat as if they were from a movie, you know. But that didn't work because then there was an order. <laughs> and I prefer it to, as if you could keep going from one to the next. Um, so there has to be time, but a very slow time. You know, when I did the installations, they had, it had to be almost a, a change that you barely noticed until it all of a sudden you said, oh, something's happened. It's not what it was. So then there's a past and a, a, a future and the anticipation maybe of change once you realize that. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. I think with that, we'll wrap up the formal, um, the formal part of the conversation. So thank you again for joining us.